the home community after five, after five years of working on one book and um, <laughs> sitting in the back rows of Yodidia and thinking about it. <laughs> uh, I will mention the two of the members of Yodidia who were very close and I were, were in this, with me in the story are not with us anymore today, one being uh, Gerald Cromer, with whom I shared my initial thoughts about this book, and the last one is David Amit, who passed away two or three weeks ago. So I did dedicate this to in their memory. Um, I began, um, I will be speaking today about this very iconic photograph. Um, actually, if it would be possible to... Can we turn off some lights? Yes, and something is missing there. There we go, that's better. Okay, I thought that was a new version that I wasn't familiar with. Um, so I will be speaking about this very, uh, this very iconic photograph, which Lawrence mentioned before, the Stroop Report, which was included within the Stroop Report. Um, I should explain the Stroop Report was basically a report submitted by um, Jorgen Stroop, the person in charge, the general in charge of destroying the Warsaw Ghetto. And at the end of this, this operation um, that lasted between April 19th and May 16th, 1943, he um, built up a, a report which included within it a photographic uh, appendix. Within this appendix was this photograph, this very iconic photograph that's familiar to all of us. Me being raised here in Israel, um, it's, it's, a, it's a photograph that I can't recall when I first saw it. It's so, in, it's so much within me. Um, and I began researching this photograph basically by mere coincidence. Um, it began in the winter of 2001 when I was um, speaking with teenagers. And uh, a few teenagers uh, mentioned um, to me that the little boy had survived. I was totally surprised by this. And it came, the most memorable moment was when I was sitting actually here in Baca with a teenager and, a, and I put the photograph on the table, and she looks at the photograph and she smiles. And I say to myself, this is not the typical response to this kind of a photograph. She looks at her father and she says, can I tell him? And he nods, and he says, and she says, he's a relative of ours. I say, okay, do you want his phone number? <laughs> sure. Um, well, that got me into the story and very quickly it turned out that all these um, accounts and that was one account, there were several other accounts of different uh, survivors as if they are the child or as if one of their relatives is the child, all of them are mistaken, all of them are wrong. The little boy did not survive, that's very clear. Um, it's already mentioned in protocols of trials taking place in Poland in, 19, in the late 1940s and 1950. Um, and none of the Jews, I was unable to identify any of the Jews. Um, what, I, what I did do was basically, what's important for me to mention here is that this, what became for me the question after I understood that identifying the, the, the names will not <coughs> yield anything, and in fact, I then understood that it was not the important question. Um, in my mind, um, the identity of this little boy is not more important than the, the identity of the little girl on the left-hand side, and their identity is not more important than any one of the people or children outside the frame of the picture. And in that sense, the identity be, be, did not, was not an issue for me anymore. But what did become a uh, question for me was I was bewildered by the fact that this photograph was included within a victory album. How can one look at this photograph of an innocent little boy raising his hands with a rifle behind him, how can one look at that photograph and basically see in it a victory or something that you feel pride in and something that you include in the, in the report that you submit to your commanders, in, in, with, again, with pride? That was the question that basically guided the five years of work that I um, dedicated to writing this book. And um, basically what I did was I collected um, the lives, or I, I, I tell the story of three uh, Nazis on the one hand and two Jews on the other hand. Um, on, the Jew, on the Nazis' side, um, the first 
if you could press on. Um, the first one is uh, Josef Bloche. Josef Bloche is a soldier standing directly behind the little boy, and I will tell more about his story in a moment. Um, I will not be speaking as about the others as much, but about him I will be speaking a little bit in detail. Um, and he was a sergeant within the Gestapo in the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, the second person is Franz Conrad. Franz Conrad is the person who photographed this picture. He was an Aust born in Austria. He was a um, low-ranking um, SS administrative officer within the Warsaw Ghetto. And he basically was the one who accumulated all the possessions that the Jews left behind them within his warehouses. So within these warehouses, he had 200 pianos. Um, we heard before about pianos. Um, it, within his warehouse, he had toys that he collected from Jewish children that were deported to the camps. Within there, he had uh, uh, piles of buttons. All of this was to be used um, for financial, for, 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 for within the Reich, to kind of recycle in our modern terms. Um, and he was uh, caught after the war and executed in Poland um, after a uh, uh, trial there. The third person, which was also mentioned frequently here, was Jürgen Stopp, um, a very high-ranking general that was brought into Warsaw on the day or two before the, uh, 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 the uprising when the uh, Germans decide basically to empty out the ghetto. And he is asked to do so by Himmler, to whom he was a very close, very close, very um, closely associated with him already back from 1933, 1932, I should say, um, where they met in his hometown of Detmold, not far from Hanover in Germany. I, in fact, visited his hometown, knocked on the door of his house, entered the house. Um, the people living there know the story of who the, how, the person who lived there before them, um, a person who was convicted of murdering um, by, the, by Polish numbers, these numbers are, can be disputed, but 56,000 uh, Jews in Warsaw Ghetto. Um, I should say it was a, a, an, 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 an experience that it's hard to communicate in words, I should say, uh, getting into the home of such a notorious Nazi. Um, so that is on the one hand, for him, this photograph symbolized first and foremost um, the Nazi, the, answering my question of how, what did he see in this photograph, for him, this photograph was a, ra what we would call a racial photograph. Basically, it is the power of the Aryan and the image of the soldier standing behind versus the Untermensch, the um, uh, subhuman Jew in the image of the little boy. So this, basically this photograph is a racist photograph. Many of the photographs we have from the Holocaust are taken from the eyes, from the vantage point of the perpetrators, and this one included. Um, for Conrad, this photograph basically was basically what are these Jews carrying within their um, bags what are they leaving behind? And um, about Bloche, as I said, I'll speak in a moment. On the other hand, and I have two Jews who um, I speak about, uh, the first being uh, Rivka Trafkovich. Rivka Trafkovich's story is an amazing story, uh, but she connects to this story. She was within the underground, not a combative uh, position, but rather more of a kind of a balabosta, the person in charge of um, managing the the house, the kitchen, and she basically manages to survive the Holocaust, but within the, war, within the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, she reports repeatedly seeing Germans taking photographs. And it can't be 100% uh, sure, but it's, there is a good chance that she saw this group of three Nazis taking photographs. I do not know which photograph. I do not know whether this one or one of the 52 others in the album or one of the 100 additional ones which are not included in the album. 
She is not within the famous photograph that I can say for sure, not within any of the other photographs, 150 or so, that I have seen. But she reports repeatedly that Germans were taking photographs, and since we know there was a restriction not to take photographs, there's a good chance she saw this group of, of, of Nazis, but it's not in any way certain. Uh, finally, I also discuss the story of Dr. Zvi Nussbaum, who claims to be the little boy, but is not, in fact, the little boy. His story is tragic. His story is horrific. Both his parents were murdered in 1942. He remained alone in the world, was taken over by his aunt and uncle, and he claims that the, 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 the photograph with him, that iconic photograph was taken on July 13th in Hotel Polski outside the ghetto when at a certain point he was taken away from his aunt and uncle and basically a Nazi soldier was aiming his rifle at him and he responded with raising his hands. Now it's a horrific story and this photograph represents his existential truth but it's not him in the photograph. That should be very clear and, um, and none we will never basically know the name of this little boy. What is very cl almost clear that he's, he, he died either within minutes by the soldier behind him or d a week later with, uh, in, in, in the camps. Now I do want to speak a little bit more in length about the uh, soldier standing behind the little boy, Josef Bloche. Josef Bloche um, um, was born in the Sudetenland and in 1912, and he was uh, raised um, in a very authoritative, authoritative family. His father was the one who basically controlled his life and determined whether he would uh, continue learning or not. He was um, the one who basically uh, shifted um, the... Uh, he, he basically determined that uh, Bloche would learn to become a waiter so as to serve in the family in in the small town of Friedland, and in 1939, he after he was in the Hitler Jugend, um, he joins the SS. At a certain point, he's transferred to the uh, Warsaw Ghetto, and uh, Ruth here earlier mentioned Frankenstein. And in many reports, people so uh, Jews did not know the na the names of their tormentors, and uh, in many reports. They, they, there is a link between that Frankenstein and um, this um, uh, Bloche. Um, um, basically, within the Warsaw Ghetto, one, one of his uh, greatest, um, one of his most famous acts was that he used to go together with his colleague, who's standing in the, on the right-hand side in the uh, original photo, Klaustermeyer, they would ride on a rickshaw down the streets of the, of, the, of the ghetto, and the Jews would disperse because they knew what was coming next. What Bloche would do at this point was aim his rifle and shoot mostly at, his most, at, 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 Jew, at women and uh, young children. And the Jews, who, as I said, did not know their name, the name of their tormentors, nicknamed this couple as Frankensteins. Um, Bloche, while I was researching this, uh, this, uh, this book, there was a story that um, came up repeatedly in the interrogations of Bloche, and um, which I c found very difficult to understand initially. Um, and the story went uh, this way. When the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising ended, um, the Germans gathered together all the Jewish policemen um, who um, assisted in collecting the Jews and shipping them to the Umschlagplatz from where they were sent to the camps. And um, Bloche describes this gathering of, of the uh, Jewish policemen in the Paviak uh, prison in the center of the Warsaw Ghetto, and the Jewish policemen know what's coming next. Um, and they're leading one Jewish policeman uh, across the street into a courtyard, and the shots are echoing back to the Paviak. Bloche takes his policeman, and he walks across the street, and as they enter the courtyard, this policeman, as I said, knows what's coming next. He turns, and he basically punches Bloche in the face and runs for his life. Another German kills him. What happens next is, is the interesting part of the story. The commander of Bloche, Brandt, comes over 
pulls away the rifle from Bloche and sends him to stand in the um, in the Paviak um, without taking part in this execution. And Bloche repeats the story years later, three or four times in his interrogation. And I was wondering why did this story register in his mind? After all, there was nothing. The, he, he didn't do nothing. The basic thing that he was demanded to do was to be passive. Why would he remember this 22 years later when he's being interrogated? And the answer was quite simple, because in his moral world, his inverted moral world, not taking part in an execution, not fulfilling a command, not taking part in killing the Jews, was a traumatic moment when his, when his commander basically scolds him. That was in my interpretation why he was why he remembered the story 22 years later or 25 years later and why it registered and why he repeats it time after time now at the end of the war Bloche um, is captured by the Soviets they don't know his identity he's taken um, into different prisoner uh, camps and at a certain point he returns to, a, uh, to his family, uh, which is at this point located in East Germany. And um, before he returns, uh, I, I, I ran a little bit f uh, fast forward, um, in one of these camps, in one of these um, uh, prisoner camps, he's asked, he, take, he, is, uh, he serves as a miner um, in an underground uh, shaft. And at a on the second day of his um, um, work there, he's curious and he looks around and he peeks through a metal shaft. And what happens next is this. He's, his face is basically caught between the, bo the bottom of an elevator and the, 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 the ground and basically um, squished in between. Um, he loses his eyes, eyesight in one side, you can see also his throat. Um, was he had a very difficult time swallowing. He goes through several um, 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 surgeries and um, basically for a year he's unable to take part. The moment he's asked to set, be sent back into the mine, he, he escapes to East Germany. Now this transfiguration of his face in some way, and I'm emphasizing the word in some way, saved him because it was almost impossible to identify between the very famous soldier in the photograph and this, uh, this, this uh, Josef Bloche. Uh, I say in some way because he, he, he remained with his true name. And if the East Germans would have wanted to find him, they could have found him, but they did not want to find him. And, in 19, uh, and when he escapes back to East Germany, he, met, he, um, he uh, meets a, a woman named Hanna Bloche and they marry. Um, this is a montage of a photograph before the accident together with his wife. Um, and they raise a family of, with three children. Um, his wife later describes him as a loving husband, a caring father who cares about each and every ailment of his children. I myself read letters that he wrote from the prison in East Berlin to his uh, wife uh, saying, Dear um, Hannah, Please make sure that our granddaughter, Ula, he already had a granddaughter when he was arrested, um, doesn't walk through the village streets alone because it's dangerous. There are cars. So basically from this monster, from this horrible killer, he becomes a, seemingly at least, a very normal, regular person. Um, and in January 11th, on January 11th, 1967, the Stasi um, arrests him. This is after he, the Stasi, uh, or the Stasi being the East German uh, Secret Service, um, after it's be, it, it was tipped from West from the Jewish West uh, Jewish West German community. Um, and on the second day of his interrogation, he's presented with a photograph from the Warsaw Ghetto, and he tells his interrogators. Um, uh, they ask him to describe what he sees in the photo, and he, he says, this is a um, aktia, this is Jews being collected and taken to the Umschlagplatz. As you can see, I am not in this photograph. And the next photograph is the photograph of the little boy. And, on the, and, a, and at this point, 
um, and this I took a photo of in Berlin, um, on the back of the photograph of the little boy, Bloche writes his admission, and it's in many, probably in a large part of it, being dictated to him by the Stasi, but still, it's true in many ways. He basically points, I am the soldier with the helmet and the go driving goggles, and uh, pointing um, a rifle in a combat position in the direction of uh, the little boy. This was um, an actia of taking Jewish citizens, and that's the reason I believe this was dictated, because that would not be his wording, um, uh, being taken to the Umschlagplatz to be sent to the death camps. Um, uh, two years later, he is uh, placed on trial. This was a, um, a orchestrated... <laughs> Show trial, show trial. Okay, sorry, that escaped me. This a show trial. I mean, all the documents of who will sit where in the audience um, uh, were in the files in Berlin. Everything was orchestrated. It was a three-day tr day trial. But believe me, he deserved what he got. There's no doubt. Despite it being a show trial, he was convicted of 20 mass murderers. Um, and, and dozens, if not hundreds, of individual killings. Um, he was executed in uh, July of 1969. His, um, his body burned, um, ashes uh, buried in an unknown location in East Germany. Um, and basically, um, Bloche um, was, in my mind, one of those Germans who after the war, when they said we only fulfilled commands, in his case, and I emphasize it in his case, I truly believe that was the case, that he was uh, raised in a, was a person of very limited intelligence and basically felt a need and thought that the authority is the one that carries moral <coughs> ground. Um, I will just end with, um, um, with saying that um, I'm going back to the story of the teenagers saying that the little boy survived. Unfortunately, the little boy did not survive. And what is curious, and this connects to, to some of the points that Lawrence uh, mentioned before, is the, this need to have this uh, victory. This, in my mind, many of the children describe this child as a child who survived, so as to come to some kind of um, feeling of there is there is tikva now with with this story of the holocaust unfortunately in my mind there is no victory there is no uh, um good end in any way or form to it uh thank you very much